All right, the fifth set of schemes work on satellite, and there is an IETF group called TCP Sat, TCP over satellite, and uh, they have, um, and there are some other schemes. We'll talk about TCP Sat works. So what TCP Sat has done is they have set out some RFCs, 2488 and 2760, and all they do is they recommend what features you should use when using TCP over satellites. Now one thing about the satellite is they are wireless, so they have this error property that the errors are very large, error rate is large, but also they have a long delay. And because the long delay, the windows are large. So the window has to be such that you can fill up the whole pipe with packets. If you take, if you take um, any TCP connection, calculate what is the bit rate, how many bits per second, and calculate the delay, how many seconds between the source and destination, take the round trip. Calculate the round trip delay times the bit rate, you will get the number of bits required to fill the pipe. That is the right window size. If your window is less than that window size, then you are not really using the full capacity of the network. If your window is more than that capacity, then you are overloading the link. The packets are staying on the queues somewhere because they're not on the wire, right? So you want to keep it exactly at that point. So, so the point is that, so on the satellite links, we need very large windows. And one thing you have to use on satellite is called a scaling option, a scaling factor. And the way, so there is a new, new feature which was introduced into TCP because of this called the scaling factor. And so now the window used to be specified as a number. Now instead of that, they have two fields, a number and a factor. The second field indicates the factor, which is you take two raised to that factor and multiply it with the window, and that is your real window. All right? So that factor thing basically allows you to specify very, very large windows required for high-speed satellite links. Second thing you need to do is use selective acknowledgement. So what is selective acknowledgement? Initial version of the uh, TCP has cumulative acknowledgement that only thing you could say is that I got everything up to four and I'm waiting for five. When you got six, you said the same thing. I got up to four, I'm waiting for five. That is a cumulative acknowledgement because once you acknowledge four, everything up to four is acknowledged. Right? You cannot say that I got six but not got five. I didn't get five. With selective acknowledgement, you can do that. The selective acknowledgement, you give a number which says I got everything up to this value, four, and then here is a bit pattern. In that bit pattern, we'll say five is not there, six is here, seven is not there, eight is here, 10 is not there, 11 is here. So that is selective acknowledgement. It tells you exactly which packets I have received, right? And on these large delay things, since the chances of losses are higher, you should use that feature selective acknowledgement. Third thing, you should not delay the acts. So one feature in the original TCP is that when you get a packet, you don't acknowledge it right away because you might get the second packet right off. So you, if you got number four and you send acknowledgement for four, then you got five, then another five, then you got six, and you got acknowledgement for six. That's just too many acknowledgement. Why don't you wait for a little while and maybe once you, after four, you will get five and then you will get six. Once you get six, then you can send the acknowledgement. Basically what they do is they wait for about 200 milliseconds or so. If nothing comes back in 200 milliseconds, then we send the acknowledgement. And if you got 100 packets in 200 milliseconds, we just send one acknowledgement per 100 packets. So that is called delayed acknowledgement, delayed act strategy. And on this one, they are saying you don't delay, you just send this, this selective act and that will reduce the reaction time. Use large initial window, and you don't start from one, because if you need to get to satellite, networks might need a window size of, let's say, 15,000 MSS, 15,000 segments. And you start from one, you go to two, go to four. You know, it will take 32 round trips before you get there, you know, some number of large number of round trips, and each round trip is large by the way. Each round trip is a quarter of a second, a half of a second kind of thing, right? 
so it's a it's a it's a long round trip so you really don't want to start from one you want to start from this is where that rule drop to one fails that is a general rule and we invented that rule by doing lots of measurements and simulations but not on the satellite links it was on mostly on the ground links so on the satellite links you don't want to go to one use larger initial window and they suggest four kilobyte which is like eight mss actually your mss could be four kilobyte itself then um, byte counting so somebody suggested actually this is um, um this is just a suggestion that increase the window by the number of bytes act rather than one mss so some people did this whole slow start two ways one is by using this mss which is what van jacobson had originally proposed that you go up by segments but somebody said no no don't do calculation in segments just do it in bytes see how many bytes have been acknowledged how many bytes have sent how many have received and all that so and and, and in their simulation that one bet was better byte counting was better than segment counting and reduce the burst from the sender and 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 don't send everything in once you know send one packet wait send the second packet if you have to send 1800 packets in one round trip then just space them over one round trip so shaped traffic is better than bursty traffic which is true even on the wired networks so anyway so these are some of the common strategies we use on the satellites so we have done quite a bit of work on satellite networks also and this is our work back in 1997 or so during the atm days and what we did was we compared the effect of what the end systems can do and what the routers can do intermediate systems can do. the end systems can do slow start can do fast retransmit can do new reno which is another version of fast retransmit and sac which is selective acknowledgement we talk about that bit map stuff right intermediate systems can do some better drop policies and drop policies could be you know we haven't talked about them but the routers don't have to just drop the last incoming packet they could drop the first packet on the queue they could drop random packets in the queue and so on and so forth there are lots of drop policies so we compared these two and the, here is our conclusion three conclusions first conclusion was that for the satellite paths end system improvements have more impact than the intermediate system based improvement so the summary is that if you are going over satellite and you know you are going over satellite then the routers can't help you much is the end system things like slow start fast recovery new you know and sac those are things that help a lot more similar in out of those four sac helps significantly selective acknowledgement is the key thing and the third conclusion was that the fairness depends upon the drop policy the routers can help only but in the fairness not so much in throughput so if they have the wrong drop policies all the packets of one source might be dropped and the other maybe so this is a simple drop policy is that if the room is full anybody who has not gotten into the room is dropped right tail drop we call it tail drop if the queue is full then all the arriving packets are dropped and that is unfair you know why because if somebody has a window size of 15000 they might have sent 15000 packets and all of them are dropped while the second guy who just got the first packet into the queue found the empty queue and all 15000 make it so we showed that by simulations and in analysis that if the traffic is bursty tail drop is unfair right so the opposite of tail drop would be head drop a random drop and basically today's wisdom current wisdom is that the random drop is better so they have something called red r e d random early drop you drop the packets not at the tail not at the front you drop it in the basically randomly basically what you do is when you need to drop you just generate a random number and num number comes out five you drop the fifth packet all right red now the word e early means that you don't have to wait till the queue is full when your key is half full even then you drop and you draw a random number although the drop random number will come will be drawn with much less probability but five by the way the random number could come out don't drop anybody so the random number could be zero and say sorry don't drop anybody and then you just don't drop anybody but so you early drop means that you know you when the queue is not full even then you will start dropping 
as the queue got in full. And as the queue got more and more full, you, your probability of drop gets higher and higher. When the queue is full, obviously you have to drop somebody. Right? So that's the current vision. So our conclusion was, and um, this was a NASA funded study, and basically NASA is dealing with satellites, so they funded our research. And so the summary is that really the end systems policies that count for satellites. Then we continued um, some more stuff on wireless, and this this slide and the next <coughs> one I think are on what we came up with. First of all, we didn't like any of the things that did anything special at the base station. Uh, in, in some sense, because um, base stations are not supposed to know TCP, right? So we, mu we must maintain the TCP end-to-end -end semantics, and that means that when you get an acknowledgement, you can be assured that it was received by the final destination and not by the base station. So that was one of the principles we set together, set down. Second thing is, modifications would be local. And if there is something wireless is specific, only two people know what the wireless is specific, and that is the base station and the and the and the mobile station. Must apply two-way traffic, and the mobile host can be both the sender or receiver. There was lots of policies that only worked when the mobile host is the sender. There were some that only worked when the mobile host is the receiver, and some worked did not work at all if the wireless link was in the middle. Sorry, the, the, the link was in the middle, the wireless link was in the middle, then work. The wireless link can be in the end or the middle, and so on and so forth. So we published the paper in 2003, and we introduced a new concept called congestion coherence. And the congestion coherence is an extension of our, of our explicit bit scheme. By the way, explicit um, bit scheme is called EC, and explicit congestion notification, which is currently on the internet, every packet that you send on the internet, if ECN is implemented, which is an RFC, if it is implemented, then th every packet will have two bits for ECN, explicit congestion notification. And those bits are set by the routers along the way when they get congested, instead of dropping the packet, I mean, when they start getting congested, instead of dropping the packet, they start setting those bits. Actually, one of the bits is set by the routers. The other is not set by the router. The other is just uh, used by the end system to send it back to the source. So there are two bits. So we said that when you get those bits, and our previous to this work was our summary was that you count the number of bits. If the bits are more than 50% are set, that means the network is congested and you reduce the load. If less than 50% are set, that means the network is not congested, you increase the load. All right, so our threshold was 50%. But with this work, we came to the conclusion that it's not just the percentage of packets, you look at the sequence of bits. If you see set, 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 and then one is, you know, you drop it, you lost a packet, and then you have set, 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 that means that bit, that packet was lost because of congestion. Everything else was telling you that we are congested, and you still sent it, so the packet got lost. On the other hand, if all the bits are clear, and suddenly you lost a packet, and then you know bits are clear. That tells you what? Yeah. It was not congested by the error, right? So you don't need explicit last notification bit. It is already there. In the sense that you look at the bit sequence, if all the bits are con this is called congestion coherence. Coherence means you know is it something that is happening all the time? If network is congested and you lose a packet, then you lose congestion loss. If the bits are clear and you lose a packet, that means it is an error loss. So we designed a whole scheme, and the whole details are there, which actually indicate the whole receiver policy, what we have to implement in the receiver, what you have to implement in the sender. And um, we'll go through that little bit here. The link layer X and the transmissions are at wireless nodes. So out of order packets received, when you receive an out of order packet, when the receiver receives an out of order packet, it checks the ECN bits. So who is the receiver? So basically the end system, mobile node, is the receiver, and it gets an out-of-order packet. What is out-of-order packet? Is that if you got one, two, three, four, then get five, and you got six, six is out of order. Right? Because you were expecting five, and you got six. So out-of-order packets, you check the ECN bits, 
if any packets marked send duplicate x otherwise defer the duplicate x so when you get 6 you see what was the bit sequence in 1 through 4 if the network was congested then you send a duplicate x and the sender will take care of it otherwise defer the duplicate x and and so defer the, and, and then um, Sorry, defer the duplicate act. Defer means you, you put it on the queue but wait. You're not going to send it right away. If the expected packet arrives, you drop the deferred act. If the packet times out, then release all deferred duplicate acts. And then you send out. If, if after a certain time you don't get the packet, now this is the receiver timing out, not the sender. If the receiver times out on the not getting the acknowledged packet, uh, the order packet, then it will send all those duplicate acts. On the sender side, when the third duplicate arrives, it checks for the EC and echo bits. And now EC and echo bit is the bit which is sent back. So now there are two bits I said in the IP packets. One is actually in the IP layer and one is in the TCP layer. In the IP layer, the router set the bit as the packet goes to the destination. And in the destination, the destination counts the number of bits. And then if it is more than 50%, it sets the echo bit which goes in the transport layer, TCP layer, to the source. The source knows that at the destination, more than 50% were set. So that is called ECN echo bit. So the mobile host checks the ECN echo bits. This is at the source, right? Checks at the ECN echo bit. If any of the duplicate X carry the ECN echo, then it retransmits the last packet, reduces the window. Otherwise, TCP defers the retransmission when the expected act arrives, it cancels the deferred retransmission, and if expected act doesn't arrive, then it starts the deferred retransmission. So basically, there are two things we need to do. We need to just distinguish between the errors and the loss. If the echo bits, which means the ECN bits, tell you that this was a congestion, then you do the old way. Pure old way is that you drop the window, you do the retransmission, and all that. If, the, uh, if it tells you just that this is the error, so the echo bits are saying there is no congestion. Then you do the new way, which is that don't do any adjustment of the window. Just retransmit. That's the summary of this method. So this congestion coherence method simply is to be summarized. Basically, this is a graph which shows different schemes we compared Snoop. So Snoop congestion coherence is the one that we proposed, obviously, on the top. Um, and then ECN and so on and so forth. Anyway. So that um, the summary of the congestion coherence thing is that um, the best um, one of the ways to do one of the ways to find out that there are congestion is just look at the bits. Now the only one mistake we have done is that after this student graduated with PhD, never published anything, <laughs> never did any implementation, never, and so that way it is just a published paper, right? And as I said, one of the things that you have to do is that you have to implement it, put the code somewhere people can use it, and then it becomes successful. So the congestion coherence is pretty good work, but it finished with that PhD and never went any further. So we haven't done any more work on that. And and the biggest thing is that we never published journal journal paper or you know bigger thing you know, and so on and so forth. Some people actually complain to me, they're saying, how come you published such important work in a conference and never published it again? This is all depends upon the students. And uh, so that's my only, only I mean, regret about that work. But anyway, so that is our last work on wireless um, TCP. We haven't done anything since then. So here is a summary. Summary of TCP or wireless. First thing is that the main concern is error versus congestion. Right? The error versus congestion um, is that um, the TCP takes good care of the congestion. However, if the loss is because of the error, then it gets confused. And it reduces the load, which can result in a very low throughput over wireless links. So there are several kinds of mechanisms. First of them is to just do something at the link layer, which means reduce or hide the error rate, link layer mechanism. Second is to split the TCP. Third is to somehow base be aware of the TCP, and then there are other mechanisms which are which is our mechanism is coherence mechanism which doesn't really change anything at the base or anything like that. It just looks at the 
bit sequence to distinguish between congestion and errors. On the satellite link, quite a bit of work has been done and um, window scaling, large initial windows and SAC are helpful. So there was, a, in addition to the window field in the TCP, we have a factor field which indicates that the window is actually window times 2 raised to that factor. If that factor is, let's say, 10, then your window might be 2, but it is really the window is 2 times 2 times raised to 10, you know, like that. So that is scaling factor. Large initial windows. So instead of starting at 512 bytes or 1 MSS, you start with a large MSS or large number of MSS. And the SAC. What is SAC? Selective acknowledgement, which means that you acknowledge the cumulative part plus a bitmap. In terms of um, Wikipedia articles, these are the ones I found. Explicit congestion notification, fast TCP, network congestion avoidance, slow start, space communication protocol, and so on and so forth. You can read them. I have our papers referred here on congestion coherence. Nitin Vaidyas has a very good tutorial on TCP for wireless. It talks about 291 slides. Basically, it talks about all those multiple schemes that we, we skipped here. There is a paper by this, as shown here, and then there is this book, which was the textbook at some point, but we are not using it as textbook. It's in the library, and the whole chapter 9 is on TCP.